We've been in this series called The Direction You're Heading, and we are going to finish it tonight. Somebody's like, amen, thank you. <laughs> hey, before we do, though, would you pull out your bulletins, pull out this little yellow sheet? It says, party in the park, because I want to talk to you about this. And it really has to do with the direction we're heading. Um, when, when I signed up in, about 18 months ago and said, you know what, we'll do the door. We'll create a service where people can come on Wednesday nights and people can come to know Christ. I didn't sign up just to do a church service. And, and, I, and I, I don't want to just do a church service. I want to do a service where people come to know Christ and then they're impacted by Christ. And next week we start to what we're calling the 40 Days of Community. And I'm really, really hoping you've signed up for a small group because I believe that the 40 Days of Community is going to change our city. I believe that, that it's going to change our church. And how we're participating from the door level is this. We're going to host this thing called Party in the Park. And maybe you like the name, maybe you don't like the name. But here's what it's about. We are going to invite kids that come from single-parent families to the park. And we are going to host a sports camp for them from about 3 years of age to about 12 years of age. We're going to host a football camp. We're going to host a soccer camp. And we're even going to host a camp for cheerleaders. That's awesome, huh? Some of you guys are like, I'm in, dude. <laughs> I've always wanted to hang around cheerleaders. But um, am I missing one? Yeah, and, and so we're going to host these things. And here's what's going to happen. Our kids that come from single-parent homes are going to come out that day. And I've got to tell you, I've worked with kids for a long time. And it is amazing when you're, when you're just hanging out with these guys, just the relationship that you can build and, and the impact that you can have. And so the direction we're heading is this. We are going to be a church and we are going to be a service that reaches out to people. Here's your opportunity. Here's your opportunity to make an impact in somebody's life. What we're asking for at this point isn't necessarily people just to say, I'm in, I'll, I'll do it. We need coaches right now. You don't have to be amazing. You don't have to be in any area. We need people who would say, I would help coach soccer. I would help coach football. I would help with the cheerleading coach. And we also are going to do this thing for three-year-olds that's just going to be like crazy games. Just hanging out, playing games with kids. And you know what's going to happen? Parents are going to bring their kids out because they want things for their kids to do. And then they're going to say, why are you doing this? Because some of you guys in here, you're single parents. And some of you guys are in here, and you grew up in single parent families. And it's hard. And it is really hard. And it feels like your kids have an unfair disadvantage. And maybe you feel like you've got an unfair disadvantage. And we're going to be able to say, you know what? Because we love you and we love your kids. That's why. And that's going to make an impact in their life. And I believe that when that impact is made, then we automatically have a bridge to be able to say, and God loves you. And so I'm asking you to participate. I'm asking you to sign up and just say, you know what, I would coach something. I would host something. We need people to give out hot dogs. We need people to give out um, to help set up and tear down and to help run the sound system. We need probably 40 to 50 volunteers to pull these um, two events off each. And it's going to be really cool. The following week, we're going to go back to the same park, invite the same kids back, and we're just going to host like a carnival where they can like throw rings on pop cans. And we probably need like hundreds of people to drink pop so that we can have pop bottles. And it, it's just going to be a chance to hang out with kids. And so if you're in for that, man, we'd love to have you. Just fill that card out after service. Take it to the door table. If nobody's there, just set it down. We'll, we'll get it. Okay? Is that cool? All right, that's my commercial. That's my short commercial. Now flip over to Genesis chapter 3. We're talking about the direction you're heading. And the interesting part about the direction you're heading is this. The direction you're heading is probably directly related to the people you're traveling with. Have you ever been with your friends and they've coaxed you into doing something totally crazy that you would not necessarily do if you were by yourself? Have you ever had that happen? I was like the instigator when I was younger. And I can remember sitting, we're at Lake Powell with our youth group. We got about 130 kids we're at Lake Powell. And we're like jet skiing and we're jumping off of cliffs and we're doing all kinds of things. And I'm with four people 
And I look up at the side of this mountain, side of this cliff, and I'm like, hey, look, let's climb up there and let's jump off. And it was 75 feet high. And so we climb, and it takes us probably 20 minutes just to get where we need to get to. And when we get there, I'm the first one there. And I am feeling like a stud. Yes, that's true. You're like, no way, you. I'm feeling like a total stud, and I'm like, this is going to be cool. And I look over the edge, and I'm like, dude, that is a long, long, long way down there. And I'm like, no way, I'm not jumping. By the time we get there, we have collected probably a half dozen boats below us waiting to watch us all die. <laughs> That's why they're there. No, they're not watching to wait, waiting to watch us jump. They're waiting to watch us land. That's the part that they think is going to be cool. And I can literally, it's so clear in the water that I can see these carp that are swimming below us, and they're like that big. Like you land on one of those, and how would you like that to be your obituary? Killed by a big fish. Him and Jonah, except Jonah didn't die. And I'm looking, and then pretty soon, those people that came up behind us were like, right there at my feet, and they're yelling, Paul, jump! And I'm like, I ain't jumping, man. <laughs> no way, are you crazy? This is a long ways away down there. And I'm looking, and pretty soon it's like, the people on the boats are yelling, come on, man, jump! And I'm like, you jump! And pretty soon, this girl says, get out of the way. And she pushes me to the side, and she jumps. And I thought, she's cool, so I married her. That's my wife. And since then, she's made me look bad many, many more times. But I've still followed around because she's cool. I can tell you of another time that I was up skiing with Jake and his brothers, and they're like these amazing guys, and they just, they ski everything. And they're pretty soon, they're like, hey, let's go down mudslide. And because I've got so much pride, I looked at them like, yeah, cool, that's cool, let's do it. Yeah, hey. And pretty soon we come to this cliff, and it is 20 feet, it's this boulder on mudslide, if you know where mudslide is up at Powderhorn. And it's, 20, it's a 20-foot drop. And I'm like, there is no way, I'm, I'm going to wet my pants before I do that. <laughs> and Troy goes off, and he does like this helicopter double daffy thing and lands it. And I'm like, dude, you are a stud. And they're going, again, it's again. Have you noticed this is a kind of the same things happen? They're yelling, Paul, come on, jump. And so finally I back up and I hit this jump. And when I do, both of my skis fall off my feet. <laughs> one lands in a tree about 20 feet above the ground. And the other one almost kills Jake, almost stabs him through the heart. But the thing is, is this, that no matter who you are, the direction that you're traveling has a lot to do with the people you're traveling with, the people you're going with. And I want you to check out Genesis chapter, one, chapter 3, 1 through 6, because we've been talking about where you're heading in life. And even before we get there, that part of where you're heading in life and part of the struggles that you have in life can be directly linked to who you're traveling with. And so, let me just kind of ask you that question. What are those struggles? What are those things that you go, oh, I need to do this differently. I need to break from the pack. I need to start heading in a new direction. Maybe, maybe and what does that look like? Does it have to do with your family or your situation or friends? And then we've got to really ask ourselves this question as Christians. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Or is he just your savior? Because the direction you're heading will tell you a lot about who you are. But the direction you're heading in life will tell you a lot about what you believe about Jesus. Because you see, if Jesus is savior of your life, when you get in a sticky position, you call on him, but you don't change your direction. The call on is, oh God, you have to save me. That's that thing that you do at 2 o'clock in the morning when the headlights are the police officer behind you. And you're praying, oh God, oh, I will serve you for the rest of my life if you'll just get me out of this one. Right? You guys have done that before? I've done that before. Or is he Lord of your life? That because of the direction you're heading, you're looking for his guidance. And you want to go the way that he's going. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, it reads like this. 
It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die, said the serpent to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of, eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. You see, what happened here between Adam and Eve was this. There's the garden. Now, the garden size, catch this. The garden size is basically the same, kind of close to the same distance between Grand Junction and Delta, and about 22 miles wide. It's not a garden. It's not like what your parents have in their backyard. It's huge. And there's two trees in the middle of the garden, and God said, don't go there. And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve, who are traveling together, they find themselves there. And I believe the reason that God, that God said, don't go there. There's, there's, there's many reasons. But I believe that one of those reasons was because he knew that's where the enemy was hanging out. That in the middle of the garden is where the enemy was hanging out. That's where you find Satan, right? You find Satan hanging out in the trees. And so the very first thing that I want you to write down is this. The direction you're heading is determined by the company you keep. You see, Adam and Eve made three huge mistakes. And the very first one was this. Was Eve was hanging around places that Satan was hanging around. That's, that, that's a huge mistake. And there's places where we go where we become way more susceptible to the influences of the enemy. Did you know that? All of us have those places, don't we? That there are certain places where you and I go. And maybe it's different for you, and may, maybe it's different for you, but all of us have those places that when we go to those places, we, became, we become way more susceptible to the enemy's lies. Right? Maybe it's a bar. Maybe it's an internet site. Maybe it's friends, maybe it's a work environment, but when you get in that environment, you end up heading down a road that you have no desire to go down, but yet you still go down it. The second thing that Eve did that was a huge mistake is Eve did not run from Satan. You see, I believe we become in a really dangerous place in our life when we think that we can hang around those places and not be influenced. It becomes a big deal in our life. Eve was hanging around places she shouldn't. And then, catch this, and then she began to have conversations that she shouldn't. I am not saying that, that you should run from non-Christians and not engage in those conversations, because it was those conversations for me, and it is those conversations for you, and it was those conversations for you, that in those conversations, you came to know and understand who God was. But there are definitely places and people that when we go there, we automatically end up in places that we shouldn't, right? Do you guys have those friends? Come on, I'm the, am I the only one? I've got them. And then we come to this conclusion, and I think this is a really dangerous place to get to. And I want you guys to hear this. This is just coming from saying, I think it's dangerous when we begin to identify places that we can go by the age that we are. I can do that because I'm 21. I can do that because I'm 18. I'm old enough. I'm mature enough. You know what? We never should ever come to the place where we begin to accept sinful situations because we're old enough. Because there's not an age limit on sin. When I was in my 20s, I used to have these ideas, and this idea went like this, that by the time I'm 30, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to struggle with this anymore. Or by the time I'm 25, and then I hit 25, it's like, oh, wow, still struggling with that. By the time I'm 30, I'm not going to do that. 
By the time I'm 35, I'm not going to do that. And what happens is this, is that the reason we struggle week in and week out is because the enemy knows our weaknesses, right? He knows your buttons, and he pushes those on a regular basis. How many of you guys have ever been in a fight with maybe like your spouse? If you're married, and you know the exact button that will set off your wife, and you're like, you're just waiting for the opportunity. And it comes up, and there's this thought in your mind, it's like, I, should, I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it. Then person like, your mother. And she just goes nuts. Like, oh, I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have gone there. The enemy knows your buttons. But here, here's the really tricky part about what happens in this, in verse, um, in this verse. Genesis 3, 1. Eve started talking to him. And then he convinced her. You see, when we come to the place where we think we're more spiritual, that we can handle these, these places that we struggle we are the naive ones. Are we not? We become the ones who are naive. And the reason why is because this, read Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Do you know why we need God? Because Satan is more crafty than we are. We need God. People generally choose the direction they will go before they go in that direction. Isn't that what happens in your mind? It's what happens in my mind. That I choose the direction that I'm heading before I ever get to the destination. And there are certain areas that I go, I shouldn't be going there. And, and there's red lights going off, and there's sirens going off, and there's alarms going off. And I just keep trucking. Right? And you watch this. I watch this happen all the time. I watch this happen in people's lives. I would even say that, that there's people in the audience tonight who are in college, who grew up in a Christian home, and you know the direction that you're supposed to be heading, and you hit that college thing, and for years you thought, man, what, that just looks like so much fun. I'm going to party when I get to college. Maybe you didn't do it in high school. Maybe you didn't do it ever, but you get to college, and your whole lifestyle totally changed. But before you got there, you made the decision you were even going there. And you guys, that becomes a dangerous deal. I watch the same thing with people that end up in sexual affairs. And I sit in my office and I counsel with them. And I can tell you that whether it was the guy or the girl, before they got to that place, they made a decision in their heart that they were going to that place. It maybe was years, but they made the decision. I have this friend... He was the guy that, there was a certain point in my life, a certain experience, there was a guy that impacted my life towards Christ, but there was one certain time that was the pinnacle moment of when I realized that God was real. And I was about 15 years of age. And him and I experienced it together. We had the exact same experience, and that experience convinced me that God was real, and that experience also convinced him that God was real. And because of that, he chose not to go that way. He said, I'm going to go a different route. And we walked away from there. Now we're um, in our, in our mid-30s, and he still is struggling following Christ. But it was a few years later that we were um, catching up, and about 24, 25 years of age, and we're hanging out. And he said, Paul, he said, I just wanted you to know that I'm, I'm seeking God again. I'm like, David, that's awesome. What, what happened? He said, dude, he said, have you ever found yourself in an experience where you end up someplace that you never thought you'd be? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, that happened to me two months ago. He had just gotten out of the army. He said, I had hooked up with some guys, and we began to hang out. And these guys were into drugs, and I had never really been into drugs, but because I was hanging out with them, I began to participate in drugs. He said, it finally came to the place where we used to go to these parties, and there was just huge mounds of cocaine on every table. When you walked through the house at different locations, there were just these mounds upon mounds of cocaine. And the guy that I had really got to become friends with and connected with was a huge drug runner for this family. And said, we had drugs everywhere. He said, one night we were sitting on our couch, and... There's just this huge party raging around us, but we are blitzed out of our mind, and we are watching America's Most Wanted. And as we're sitting there watching it, the guy that I have become friends with 
is on the TV. And he is listed as one of America's most wanted for drug distribution. And he said, and all of a sudden, I am blitzed out of my mind. And I'm going, how did I get here, God? How did I get so far away from you? You see, the company you keep definitely determines the direction you will go. Amen? You see, 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. And we know that righteousness just simply means right living. And right living is just a life that is right before God. Flee the evil desires of your youth and pursue a right lifestyle before God in faith and love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And then 1 Timothy says, 6, 11 through 12 says, But you, O man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. All Timothy is saying is this. He's saying, if you have made a decision to live your life for Christ, then do it. Do it with everything that's in you. Man, hang around people who will lift you up and will, who, who love God like you love God. People who desire to be like Christ don't hang around places that make them fall. People who desire to be like Christ don't hang around places that make them sin. I, I, I hate watching people, and I get to watch this all the time. I love building relationships. And I watch guys come in, and they really commit their life to Christ. And they come in, they commit their life to Christ, and they're going strong, they're going strong, they're going strong. And all it takes is one friend from the old lifestyle back into their life, and all of a sudden it's one foot. And then they're just not, not quite doing so well. And then pretty soon... They're not just not doing well. They're not doing anything. And then pretty soon you're saying, hey, where's this guy at? Oh, I haven't seen him for months. Why? They stopped pursuing righteousness. They started hanging back out in the places that made them stumble. You see, the second thing is this. The direction you're heading is determined by the belief systems you hold. You will go in the direction of the belief systems that you hold. And you will always take that path in those belief systems. So that means this. Let me just ask you a question. And you can write this in your notes. You can write it off the side. You can put it somewhere. You can pencil it right in your head. How do you see God? What is your image of God? Because of your, your history in life has given you a conclusion of what you believe God to be. And at some level, it's convinced you that you show up here on a Wednesday night. Or maybe you're, you're still seeking, and you're trying to find out who, who God is. And maybe you're hanging around some really good people, and they believe in God, and so you're coming with them. Do you see God as loving or unloving? How about this? Do you see him as forgiving? I mean, you know that he forgave you, but do you see him as forgiving? Maybe you see him as second rate. You see, here's the deal. Eve thought that God was holding out on her. I don't know if you guys were in the Easter service this weekend, and, and Dan made a confession that was a confession for Dan, but it was also, I, I was like, Dan, man, I, I bought into that too, man. That there was this, because he had been raised in the church, he came to this conclusion at some point in his life where he began to think, that the people on the outside have it better than those on the inside. I heard a guy talking one day, and he says, I don't, I don't get it. He said, I didn't come to Christ until I was like 24 years of age. And man, when I came to Christ, I came running in the doors, and all of a sudden, before I knew it, I was watching my friends, and they were trying to run out the doors. And he said, what? What are you running to? I know what's out there. What are you running to? And when we buy into the idea, and a lot of people buy into it, that, that the people on the outside have it better than the people on the inside, guys, and man, you've done the same thing that I've, you, you've done it. 
You, you've been there. And you know that anytime you go back to the lifestyle, that it is unsatisfying. And that Christ is satisfying. I think it's interesting, the prodigal son in Luke 15. The prodigal son is a story about this kid that thinks his dad's holding out on him. And, and so he goes to him and he says, Dad, he says, I want my inheritance. And traditionally, people didn't get their inheritance until their father died. And so this kid was making a statement that said, and you know what, Dad? I wished you were dead. I wished you were dead. I want my inheritance, and I don't want to wait till you're dead. So give it to me. And this dad was wise enough. He understood that people have to choose whom they're going to serve. You and I both have to choose whom we're going to serve. And so he said, you know what? Here you go. And I think this, this, this is a tough statement, but if you think God is holding out on you, try and get a better deal. You see, the prodigal son, he went out and he thought his dad was holding out on him, and all of a sudden he finds himself in the place where he realizes that his servants have it better than he has it. The lowliest servants have it better than he has it. Joshua 21, Joshua stands up in front of the people that he's led. And he just simply says, you know what, I'm going to die. And he says, and there's this lifestyle that the Amicalites live. And some of you guys are really attracted to it. But I'm just telling you right now, man, the best deal you will get is serving God. And so if you want to live this lifestyle, go for it. But for those that want to serve God, let's make that declaration. And I'm saying that tonight. Let's make that declaration. You see, everyone has to choose God because God doesn't have any grandchildren. This afternoon I was thinking about a situation that I'm dealing with. And I just really came to this conclusion that, you know, that if you have to justify your actions, then your actions are probably unjustifiable. Does that make sense? When we come to the place where we have to justify our actions, then they're probably unjustifiable. When you have to say, hey, I'm 21, it's my 21st birthday, or, or whatever. I, no, I can do this, I'm 21. Or, you don't understand, Paul. And, I, and I've heard this one. You don't understand, Paul. My husband doesn't love me. He doesn't show me affection. Or how about this one? But God, the woman you gave me made me do it. Right? Isn't that what Adam said? The woman you gave me. This was not my fault. You gave me this woman. And she screwed me up. Ephesians 4.1 says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. You've been called to live for God. By God. Here's what that's saying. Is that God's called you, man. He has called you. He said, here's the life. You're worthy of it. You can do it. And he's called you. I also believe this. I believe that the direction you're heading shouldn't lead, lead others to doing um, down a wrong road. The direction you're heading shouldn't lead others down a wrong road. Genesis 3, 6, the second part of it. I'll read, read the whole thing. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it, and she also gave some to her husband with, who was with her, and he ate it. You know what? It's one thing to head down a wrong road. It's an entirely different ball game when you encourage others to go with you. Have you guys ever done that? You're like, hey guys, come on. This will be fun. Let's everybody go. And then pretty soon you're like, uh, no, Mr. Police Officer, uh, things are good. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 through 34 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. And I say this to remind you. I say this to shame you. In Matthew 18, 6 says, But if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. The direction you're heading shouldn't lead others down a wrong road. 
It shouldn't cause others to stumble. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did you really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? See, here's what I believe the unforgivable sin is. This is just my belief. I believe that the, the unforgivable sin is people that know God, that love God with all their hearts, or that know God, not love God with all their hearts, that know God and intentionally lead people, other people not to know God. That, that their desire is for people not to know God. They know God, but they don't want other people to know God. Because isn't that what Satan does? Isn't that Satan's big deal? Is that he knows the truth, and he works tirelessly so that other people don't find the truth. And that was the deal that Satan is in the garden, and his purpose there is to deceive those who are trying to live a life towards God. There is nothing worse than those people who know what is right and try and convince others to do what is wrong. That's a dangerous deal. And I want you to be careful in that. And I want you to give you one more. The direction you're heading won't change until you confess your need for God. You see, confession is the key to forgiveness. Confession is the key to knowing God. 1 John 1, 9 through 10 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Confession is the key that will totally change the direction where you're going. And here's what's really interesting, is that confession is for the person who is struggling. Did you know that? It has nothing to do with God. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that God knew that Adam and Eve had blown it? Do you think that he was surprised? Like he comes walking around the corner, he's like, hey, what are you guys doing? They're like, hey, we're, we're naked. Like, oh, you're naked? You're kidding me. Who told you that? You know? And they're like, hey, we blew it. And he's like, you did? When did you do that? No. God knew. When they confessed and God forgave them, it, it wasn't for God. See, we think that confession is for God. We think that confession is about, okay, God, I don't know if you knew this, but I did this. And God's like, oh, geez. You did what? Like, yeah, I did that. Can, can you work that out? I, I don't know. That's, that's kind of a big deal. No. Confession is for us. Because when we confess what we did, that's when God is able to bring healing to what we've done. You see, when we confess what we did, that gives God the ability to come in because what you're asking is like, when you say, hey Lord, I need you. I, I, I I'm struggling in this area, and I need you. God can't come in until we let him in. Until we say, Lord God, I need you in my life. Because every person has the need to be right with God. And confession is that thing that makes us right with God. So let me just close by asking this question. We can have the worship team come on back up. Let me just close by asking this question. The direction you're heading is obviously determined by those that you're traveling with. Are you traveling with the right people? That's a great question. And that's not just a question for 20-somethings. That's a question for 30-somethings and 40-somethings. Are you traveling with the right people? Are you heading down the right road? And then let me ask you this question. As you're heading down whatever road you're heading down, is Jesus, has he been and is he your Lord or is he your Savior? Is he the guy that you shoot to when things are falling apart but you never really change your course? Or is God really guiding the direction you're going? The, the decisions you're making, are they based upon that idea of, Lord God, I want to honor you with my life. 
Because if He's your Savior, then you'll constantly find yourself hiding from Him. But if He's your Lord, you'll constantly find yourself running to Him. And we're just going to sing one last song. And as we sing that one last song, maybe this is the place where you just say, you know what, God, I need you. And you don't have to do that anywhere but in the quietness of your heart. But I want to ask you to stand up and that during this last song that you'd really say and determine, are you heading down the road that you want to be on? And are you heading down a road that leads you closer and back to God? Because we are all either heading towards God or heading away from God. Amen? Let's stand.